okay, I met someone. And she's not from Egypt and she's not an Arabic speaking person. And, 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 and he just looked at him and he says, yes, what's your problem? Well, I really like her and I want to marry her. And what's your problem? And he says, but she's, it's going to be cross-cultural. And then he looked at him and he said, no, my son, your biggest problem is you're marrying a woman. Emmanuel is an Afrikaans girl that left South Africa at a young age. She lived around the world and married cross-culturally. Caleb and I had a great conversation with her. It ranged from lots of fun moments to the depths of the responsibility we carry in who we are. Enjoy our conversation with Natalie. to say thank you so much for our beautiful guest today Natalie um, and then Caleb is also today with us I am so thankful for you guys to join me at extreme times Caleb it's late at night and Natalie it's quite early in the morning um, so Natalie welcome thank you very much Louise thanks for inviting me and Caleb can you just in one sentence quickly tell us where you are and what at the moment because every time we record yeah. you somewhere else <laughs> I know I'm, I'm a traveler I'm currently in a small town called Williams Lake in British Columbia and I'm helping out with the Canadian Red Cross so I'm 10 hours or nine hours time difference from you so but it's it's still so good so. yeah thank you for joining us <laughs> Yeah, so Natalie, no um, you are a little older than me, but you also grew up in apartheid South Africa. And then by the end of our, when things changed in South Africa, um, when we had our elections for our first democratic ele election, you found yourself in America at that time. And you had a very specific experience with that. But at the same time, looking back at how you grew up and then also looking forward at how you see um, the, the Afrikaners and where we are at at this point. Can you share a little bit some of your thoughts on that? Well, that's a big thought, Louise. <laughs> that's a whole book. <laughs> I know, but, I know. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I did grow up in apartheid years and I think my situation was very challenging in the sense that my father was actually a general in the army and so we were kind of in the heart of what was going on although for our generation we were in school at that time so things were hidden to us Things were not told us. We didn't get the whole story. We didn't any, even realize how people were really living out there because it was like as if our parents were keeping it a bit away from us or it was secretive. Or And, of course, the television at that point wasn't as vivid as it is now. Now you can watch wars. You can watch how America bombed Iraq and you can sit there and watch it on the TV screen. That time, when we were under apartheid, it was like a war zone, but it wasn't on TV. So we were divided in this country, the ones that was going through the war and the ones that was actually protected from it mm. and hidden, which is so unfair because as a generation now, in our age group, Louise, we, we sit with our peers that have a different story from us, and we were raised ignorantly of it and I think it was very challenging for me but the bits and pieces we did find out because I became a Christian in my matric year finally in school 1988 and then went straight at, into university but all my holidays were spent in either Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi on mission trips I loved loved mission trips and mm. but when we wanted to go into Soweto or Soshanguve, or Winterfeld, or we were forbidden. So for me, the major crisis was, why can't we reach within our own nation into desperate areas? Why are we allowed to go across borders? What are the secrets that are being kept from us? Why am I allowed to go to Mozambique, where there was also a war, between Frilima and Renamo, why can I why can I why can I go there, but I can't go into Soweto 
why was it so anyway i think these things triggered me and made me rebellious actually against what was going on and we did have our sneak peeks and we even had a night out in soweto and i think uh, <laughs> we could talk about it now but those times we could have been arrested by the police but uh, yeah that sketch a little wow. part of how i how i observed the injustice mm. it was very challenging um especially where, where because i became a christian yeah. yes caleb so i just want to ask were you and your friends kind of like that like you realize like yo like there must be a, a bigger picture like you i mean you, you don't have to share everything about sneaking on sweat though but was there that curiosity that was like yes. hey we're not getting a full picture or yeah Yes. Wow. And you you wow. you could see in the newspapers glimpses of where the police would go in and there would be raids in in townships and you could see it's horrendous. Mm -hmm. But you didn't understand why. Why did people even have a pass that the lady that worked for us why did she have to sleep over when it gets dark? Why can't she travel home to be with her family? So those little triggers as a kid you you didn't understand. And now, more later, as an adult, you you understand how horrific it truly was. Yeah. So then you were in America when when the elections happened, and uh, you shared a little bit the other day of how it was for you to be in that context when that happened. Yes, I was the first Christian in my family, so for me, I desperately wanted to get discipled. And I read a book called No Compromise by Keith Green. It's for the older people, Caleb. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I love Keith Green. Oh, no. Actually, yeah, we actually helped his widow move out of a house in Kansas City. Long story short, but so I such respect for Keith Green. Oh, love Melody it. Green, yeah. yes. Melody Green, So I read yeah. the story and I had to be there. I had to be there. Oh. So I, I wrote her because he already died oh. by then. I wrote yeah. her and she said, please come, come live on the ranch with us in Texas. And wow. we will disciple you and you can do the journey with us. And um, I, I got enough money together to get my plane ticket because she said, just come with a plane ticket. Get yourself here. Got enough money, uh, went there. Anyway, long story short, I was four years on the farm in Texas. Anyway, she then later moved to Kansas. I met her again in Kansas and then she moved to California. Yeah. So we were helping him move to California. So oh, know. wow, <laughs> Caleb. Yeah. Wow, you're like an wow. insider now. I just thought you were a baby. But no, man, you're an insider. You're part of my groupie. Yeah. Come on, I'm telling you. <laughs> I love it. So I lived on the ranch for four years and, oh, loved it. Oh, my goodness. So we called it the last days of last days. That's when I was there. Got discipled. Traveled the entire U.S. in um, vans and ministered everywhere. And then this band came from, from South Africa. Um, yo, who was their names? It was called, they did this We Are One recording. Oh, I know about it, but I don't know who they were. Yes, I can't remember the name right now. But they were amazing and they came to Texas. And somebody gave me a ticket and I wept through the whole two hours. I was just undone. Um, because they had this song, Though We Are Many, We Are One Body. Yeah. Friends First. Friends First was one of their groups. And then, anyway. Um, and then there was election time. So I traveled with my friend to Dallas because we were on a ranch. And went to Dallas and stood in a long line for our first democratic election. And then I saw how many South Africans were already living in Dallas and left the country for different reasons. Um, it was very multiracial, the line, maybe 200 of us. And we stood for a while to get your turn. They let us in little by little, the embassy. Um, and we could hear one another's stories. How did they end up in Texas and why? And that was heartbreaking. And many wept, saying, um, we never wanted to leave. But because we, we, we couldn't stay, 
we were brilliant at school, but there was no opportunities for us because of our race. And if we wanted to become anything in the world, we had to leave our nation and come to a nation that will give us education. So there were doctors, dentists, engineers, because they were not white, they could never become that. So they had to, they had to go study there. And I think it broke my heart that they were so sad, saying, here we are in the U.S., and we long for home. And here we are voting for our first non-white uh, president. And uh, of, of course, all of us stood there. We all had badges and T-shirts for Mandela, and we were all voting for a new day. And I, oh, it was emo very emotional. I was undone. Just to be with mm. all, uh, all of us together in another nation, all voting the same thing, and some of them said, if he gets in, we're going home. And, uh, yeah, I felt so sad that they had to miss out so much and leave because of the wrong color. And this is Africa. How can African people leave Africa? Yeah. Yeah, wow. I think it must have been very emotional to be there in that moment, eh? Um, yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. And I mean, I think I'm just wondering when you were standing there, what, what did you see now? How many years? 21 years, 22 years going down the line where we are at now? I was wondering what your thoughts were then and what's your thoughts now and how they compare in a way. <laughs> yeah, I think originally it was more a feeling of shame. How could we have done it? And why did it go on so long? Um, but knowing a little bit from my father's background, and he was involved in all the negotiations and getting Mandela out of prison and, and seeing a new day, um, they worked towards that and desired it and knew that nothing could go on the way it was. But there was a shame on me thinking, this I will walk with for the rest of my life, wow. that I was an Afrikaner girl in that era. And I knew I was going to have to deal with this because wherever I went and stayed since that day, I mean, I, although I lived in Texas and um, a lot of people didn't know so much of the history, it was completely, it was always in the news, more on that side than on this side. Yeah. And... Um, when we once had to go underground, there was a tornado coming through the ra ranch and we all had to go underground and then they played um, a movie, South African movie. And um, they all looked at me going, are you Afrikaans? Because they knew I, <laughs> I was a South African. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Wow, did you guys do this? And we're like, yeah, my people did. Mm -hmm. And I knew. You're going to walk with this. So what are you going to do about it, you know? So if I didn't know God, oh, it would be challenging. But with God, I wrestled yeah. through a lot of how I felt. What did I do with it? If I can jump in, because, you know, it's one of the themes, even one of the, the earlier podcasts we, 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 we recorded, um, you know, another lady was also sharing her story about growing up in the apartheid uh, era. And... And now looking at the contrast, you know, 2021 with the world that we live in now, um, you know, I, I have been living in the States. I have loved living in the States. Um, but as, as anyone that watches news knows, everything that's going on with Black Lives and the whole movement with Black Lives Matter. And so, it, you know, it's, I love it. I mean, nothing new is under the sun, as we all know. And it is this whole history thing just repeating itself. I guess for those that would even be listening to the podcast, I would want to ask you, Natalie, because I think, I don't think, I know you are a woman of a lot of wisdom who has walked through, like you just said, a lot of that shame. But how has that, even now, watching 2021 with how people are dealing with racism, like obviously that probably brings stuff back up, like what happened like 26 20 plus years ago but what would be some of your answers now mm. if that makes sense like mm. from what you have learned from 20 plus years yes. ago um 
I'm I'm just very grateful that I was in Texas in that time. Very grateful. Mm. Simply because then connecting with South Africans within Texas and Dallas. And later I moved to Colorado Springs and um, I, I stayed actually in many different states over time. Um, and I always yearned and connected with other tribes and cultures and languages. And um, what I saw from what my South African non-white friends in, in, in America shared with me was um, South Africa made a law, but the rest of the world lives with apartheid. Later in my life, I again moved to, to America, and actually my two children were born there in that time when we, we actually were connecting with IHOP in Kansas and um, stayed with many friends in Michigan over time. And I... What I could see was that apartheid is a condition of the heart. And people choose to separate themselves from others. There's an inherent hierarchy in people's lives that you want to be a little bit more superior in someone else. Mm. And there's always... Um, nationalities or races around you that you have to always check your heart. Apartheid was a law system, a horrific law system that had an outward application that affected millions. But racism is alive and active and it's a state of your heart. So it's, we paid, we put a lot of boundaries in the nation and borders and what 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 but what about our hearts and the lord has started saying to me i can only deal with your heart i can't change a nation i deal with a person's heart he has access to our hearts and i had to give him my heart and say lord let there be no racism in my heart let there be nothing in my heart that makes me superior in anybody else um, wow. and i think Throughout life, and I worked in many nations, and I traveled literally all over the world, from Asia to Africa to, and always check my heart that I don't go, oh, why did they do it like that? Why are they like that? Why do they? And the whole of, thing of about uh, Black Lives Matter, it was only t coming. It was a timing thing. It was gonna be revealed. It was gonna come to the light because. Our God is in the business of bringing everything to the light. And I think we're moving more fast into eras where things cannot be hidden because he wants freedom and he wants us to be free. So if you're walking with racism, he says, I will bring it to the light to heal you, my bride, my church. So he's dealing with the church first. He's coming to us first. He is hunting us down going, I want a pure bride. And so we cannot live with with racism first never mind what the world does so when things get exposed don't run from it don't deny it don't deal with your heart quick 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 because yo he's coming for one bride and they are beautiful and they will be from every tribe and tongue and nation and if you can't deal with this as a tribe let us wa the walls of your heart come down and get compassion and only the lord can give that so in that context, we we just have to be desperate for him. Absolutely. So the whole world, it's still going to come more and more. Where there is uh, the Kurds, the, the Iraqis want to wipe out the Kurds, or the wherever there's tribes, wherever there's tribes, it's a, it's a challenge. So, yeah. I think uh, since you're talking about the different tribes and the and the beauty of it, also in in essence that you sort of saying, I'm sure there's a working way of how you have figured it out for yourself, how 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 God revealed it to you, how nations is supposed to be actually next to each other and speaking into each other's lives or be together. And for me, uh, a picture that I got. Uh, that maybe you can relate to because you're an artist, <laughs> is, is putting colors, different colors next to each other. And for me, if you put a 
green next to a red, the red will really pop. And sometimes it was for me like that when I am with certain people groups, it's like they just bring something out of me. And that's now very, very personally. So it's not, it's more me, but I mean, even globally, if you think about it. um, Yeah. So I was wondering, do you have a sort of an idea? a way that you've placed it in your mind of figuring out how how it should be together. Um, <laughs> maybe from a biblical model, but even just in a practical way, <laughs> how you approach situations yeah. when you are with people of different cultures and so on. I think we all have been watching The Chosen. Oh, yeah. And just, I think from a cultural point of view of how relational Jesus actually Mm -hmm. was. And I think if God had to choose a nation to send Jesus into to be born, that's the perfect one because the Middle East is extremely relational. And it's not about tasks. It's really about people, number one, Mm -hmm. for example. So I think practically, because I ended up, working in North Africa and the Middle East, and then eventually married an Egyptian. (laughs) Woohoo! Come on now. (laughs) And um, I think think from me coming from a European background, living in Africa, um, I think I was halfway there. Not quite European, (laughs) but halfway. And I just, like you say, the popping of colors. I think when I entered the cultures of North Africa and the Middle East, which is extremely relational and Mm -hmm. extremely hospitable, even if they are extremely poor. Mm -hmm. Um, What a joy to to be embraced and pulled in by them. And then slowly you start to see yourself melting, Mm -hmm. melting into, wow, this is what it's supposed to be. Wow, I'm so loved. Wow, they're so caring. Wow, they 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 take such good care of um, hosting it, it, with a the little they have, and you don't want to leave. You know, mm-hmm. you visit someone for the afternoon, and then you find yourself sleeping over, and then it's a week later. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's who they are, and um, I think I had no choice but to marry my husband when he asked me. I was like, of course, of course, of course. I can't imagine him marrying anyone else. Um, just it's I think we need one another in that context because I was more task orientated and uh, I had a vision and I was gonna do the vision Mm. and learn Arabic and I am and I am and then you realize no we we they never talk about I it's we we're a team and we are gonna and they pull you into something so much more bigger and wonderful and we're never, never going to let you go and we're going to do this thing together. And wow, wow. Mm. You, they know about you. They're very transparent. They um, take care of each one. It's like really like the book of Acts when it says, and they were together and mm. no one had needs. Mm-hmm. They're aware of one another. It's not just you, one of the crowd. They, it is always they move in packs. I say, <laughs> you know, you get animals in the Kruger Park. They are loners. There goes one, one. And then you get the pack animals that they never separate. Um, yeah, the Middle East, North Africa is pack animals. <laughs> and i wanted to be part of the pack because my culture is very individualistic and you always pursue your own goals you don't consider how it affects the tribe you know you know for for even those that would be listening i i think something that needs to be even addressed is just the joy in celebrating the diversity of one's culture um, because I think that's exactly, you know, all three of us here have, have been blessed to travel the world through different um, spheres of influence. And in all of our travels, it's, it's been that. It's been actually a, a joy of celebrating the different diversities. I mean, whether it's eating foods that might make you gag or eating foods that you roll out like a ball because it's so good. But there's that sense 
um, of appreciation. And I know for me as a 26 year old, when I'm speaking with even the ones that I'm working with now, um, or just ones that have not traveled or don't have that, um, yeah, that don't might have that understanding. Like there is just this, I don't know. I'm just, I'm very, I realize hearing, hearing you speak, Natalie, like there really is that appreciation that one must take of saying like, and the Lord has blessed us to be able to travel, to, to learn from each other's um, ethnicities, to learn from their background. And I love you speaking, how you're speaking about um, North Africa and the Middle East, because you're right. It is such, you know, we can learn so much. We ought to, we ought to. Um, and so that's, that would only be, honestly be my biggest encouragement for those that would even listen is that it would be this sense of um, silencing yourself, silence your culture for a second and, and say, what can I hear from so-and-so? What can I actually learn, you know? Because, yes. yeah, it's... That's so yeah. good, Caleb. Yeah, that is so true. Oh. I think even biblically, um, when I ended up in... in um, Morocco. I love, oh, I love Morocco. Um, when I ended up there, and I spent almost 15 years in and out, in and out. And um, making friendships, deep, deep, deep friendships. I think yeah. some of my deepest, more, most connected friendships are still Moroccan, Moroccans. And when we would sit in a circle and share, how I would keep myself not bringing biblical truths according to me from my context you know we read the bible even differently culturally mm -hmm. i'm sure how i think oh jesus meant this and when i'm sitting in that context and they said to me now jesus meant this and i'm like Ooh, yeah <laughs> you're right oh my goodness oh. why did yeah. i put jesus in a box and make him mm. think like me anyway <laughs> I, I I love how even the word gets filtered through yeah. our cultural, you know. So we need one another that we don't get molded into, you know, when you get an ice tray and you pour the same water into the ice tray, but depending on the shape or form of that ice tray, it can be hearts or squares or triangle. I don't know. You know, you get many different ice mm -hmm. cube trays. It's the same water going in there, but how does it get frozen? Oh, my goodness. Okay. I don't want to have a frozen heart and have a triangle point of view of life. I'd rather have a round one. So mm. um, <laughs> I want to change That's my th this uh, vase or whatever it is, you know, say, Lord, make me so flexible that I'm not filtering it through my cultural mm. perspectives or how I was trained or who told me my grits yes so sitting in a moroccan context i was telling the lady something and they would go uh-uh that's not what he meant and then i realized here i am trying to be wow. a little uh trying to you be know, the teacher trying to yeah i'm bringing yeah. my beautiful inside and then i'm like poof so my first <laughs> few years were just like breaking all my little popping all my balloons no, it was so good. It was so good. <laughs> Fortunately, I had my husband to fall back, and he was like, "Yeah, you know, let me tell you what we think or how I see it." Or, and then I realized Jesus was actually very clever, giving one word, the Bible, to all of us. And if we do not corporately listen to one another, we lose some of the treasures yeah, that are in there. That's so good. So, how is the cross-cultural relationship with your family to your husband? You say your family, you were the first believer in your family. Now, how how is that seen as an, a white Afrikaner to an Egyptian? Yeah, how has that, how has that been? <laughs> oh, very good. Ish. Actually, very good. He, uh, as Louise have seen him, he, he does not look like a typical Arab. He is uh, quite light-skinned, and his name is Henny, which is a very popular South African name. And, uh, yeah, I think when I called my parents and said I met someone, then, um, of course, they knew it was going to be a foreigner because 
for so many years I was already living overseas and oh I met someone my dad just went quiet and he said uh what nationality <laughs> and then I had to say well Egyptian he goes oh no you have no idea and I said dad I know him oh. I know him <laughs> And uh, my family was still not Christian, so it was a challenge. But he came to visit, and my family all fell in love with him. And I yeah, think I just... Yeah, he's such a winsome man. <laughs> yes, I fell down in, in my, um, how can I say, my level of, um, you know, I was quite high up there. I was quite loved, you know. But I, I, I dipped, and he took a higher spot so he's definitely very close to my mom and dad right now and he's oh, a fantastic yeah. son-in-law because he's relational and he's very attentive and he he has things in his culture where you take care of your parents and he takes care of my parents like he is aware of any need that they will have and he jumps in and he takes care of it because culturally it's so non-individualistic here we, you know, somebody gets older, you think of how to move them into a facility that can take care of them. It's horrific, but it's how the culture operates. He does not think like that. He's like, how are we going to take care of them? How are we going to position ourselves and create the home where they have a room and we will take care of them? So I think they feel that sense of they just gained another son. So um, I think he's a blessing to our family very much. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, I'm sure in the journey of being married to a um, cross culturally, there must have been some challenges and some some way some things to overcome. But uh, that's also really become really a testimony. Has really been beautiful. So uh, I don't. Yeah, if if there's something that you feel you you can share a little bit about that, I think we would love to hear. I'm sure there's other people that can maybe relate from that. Yeah, it's a, it's or a some just advice. Yes. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm about to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm okay, my anyway, best yeah. advice, Caleb, is, is which the advice that my husband's pastor from Cairo gave him when he went to Cairo and he said to the pastor, okay, I met someone. And she's not from Egypt and she's not an Arabic speaking person. And, 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 and he just looked at him and he says, yes, what's your problem? Well, I really like her and I want to marry her. And what's your problem? And he says, but she's, it's going to be cross-cultural. And then he looked at him and he said, no, my son, your biggest problem is you're marrying a woman. <laughs> that is cross-cultural. That wow. is cross-cultural. Hey. Okay, so Caleb... The thought of even getting married, it's, it is cross-cultural. You. You're going to marry someone with a complete different culture from you. We women operate very different from men. And I think in our marriage, that's the only thing. We even last night talked about it. And he just said, it's, it, that is the bottom line. That is, it's not even our cultures. Because remember, our personalities are stronger than our cultures. So my personality wow. is more task-orientated which he is not at all. So our clashes are when I'm like, today we are uh, painting a room. But in the meantime, he didn't tell me that he is actually having coffee with someone and then he planned to have a bike ride with someone else. And then oh, he... See, Luis knows me. Like, this is going to be me. Like, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> He's so relational. And for him, that painting this room can wait. It doesn't have to happen today. But for me, it is my day where I set aside and I planned it. And, and he doesn't plan a thing. So that's, re that's personality. That's personality. Yeah. So I can't say that our wrestling has been cultural. It's personality and that he's a man. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there, there you have it. Literally, and I spoke to a lot of cross-cultural marriages because in Egypt – all the people that left Egypt to go work in other nations mm. married a foreign girl because Egyptian girls do not travel much, but the Egyptian men do. So they come back to Egypt with a Swedish wife, a British wife, an American wife, a Canadian wife, an Australian, wherever they went. Mm. So we would get together and we would have good laughs. And we always realized at the end of the good laughs, it was 
really because we were women that they laughed at us and we laughed at them because they were men because our jokes were not that they're Egyptian. Our jokes were, you know, they, they do men things. So yeah. that's my answer on marriage. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Good. That's good. So getting back a little bit, um, there's one question I really want to ask you, um, and it's a bit more on a serious side again. Is um, So lately in the community, Christian communities, on the ones uh, we've seen when it comes to cultural identity, there's people that really feel like if I'm a child of God, I just need to strip myself of any aspect of my culture and, and just embrace a kingdom culture. And then on the other side, we've, I've also experienced that people uh, – strip themselves of their, their culture, but then embrace a Jewish culture as a as, as sort of the thing to, to embrace. But you, in your, in your notes, you said, said embracing one's nationality and culture as it is, is essentially a foundational part of our contribution to the body of Christ. So I want to just hear what's, what's your thoughts on that and how, how you see all of that. Yes, I, I was staying, I was living in Colorado springs um with ywam when i met um two amazing people one was Landa cope she also is with ywam and mm-hmm. the other one we was floyd well. klang yeah, yeah. and the other one is floyd klang and sitting under Landa cope's teaching i realized that being embarrassed and ashamed and realizing what the afrikaners have done I could not choose to try to run away from it and go in denial and say, um, I have no part of it. I'm now only kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. I'm a child of God. Um, Because you can't change your nationality. You are born in one nation. And you are born in a certain time, an era, a nation, a people group with a purpose. And you cannot dump that purpose and suddenly go, oh, I'd rather be, because I carry now a Spanish passport. I can't say I'm Spanish. I just carry a passport. It's a paper that gets me around. Just because I lived there for 15 years doesn't make me Spanish. I could identify, but I cannot, I cannot take it on. The only thing I can embrace is being South African, born in apartheid as an Afrikaner. Why God chose to put me within this, the mystery is still to be revealed. But I realized yes. embracing and say, yes, this is what my people have done. And then going through a, a, a deep, can I say, season, seasons, because it comes and goes, of repentance. Because my forefathers are French Huguenots from France, and what France did in North Africa is horrific. So I'm a double whammy. So now we're going back saying, my ancestors did that in North Africa? Well, I was a French Huguenot, and my people group from my mom and dad's side were persecuted and fled to South Africa. That's why we ended up in Africa. So having to trace who you are in your roots is essential to say what was the journey of, let's say you're German, let's say you're American, British. Um, there's a trace, there's a tracing you can do. Who were my forefathers? Who were my ancestors? What happened to them? What was their journey? Why did they end up in South Africa? And how was the Afrikaner people even formed and shaped? And the atrocities that they went through. And then I'm not part of that. So asking forgiveness is essential. Mm -hmm. Receiving forgiveness is essential. And then you can cut the things that you carry, which are curses. In the blood of Jesus, you can cut it and say, Lord, forgive my people. Forgive me. Forgive me for my heart. That is because individually we have to repent far more than just for our ancestors and what they've done. My heart has to be pure before God. So individually we carry more. Then I can say, well, my father was in the military in a very 
ugly, brutal time in South Africa. Father, forgive him, forgive me, forgive my family for what, you know, that we don't carry this into the next generation and the next ge generation. With the blood of Jesus, we can finish, mm. you know, a certain era, certain things that happen. But embracing that I'm a fringe Hagenot is also incredible because they became the seed of the gospel within Africa. Because when I was invited to go to a meeting of French Huguenots in France, tracing my history, and going to the town where my parents, the area my parents' uh, families were from, I was sitting in a meeting, a worship meeting for five days, and they washed my feet and they wept and they said, um, for what we, the French, have done to the Huguenots, can you forgive us? Because you, your people, your forefathers had to flee for their lives because they were, they were full on going for God. They were like spirit filled. And the, the Catholics, and, the, and the, um, I don't know who exactly was persecuting the, the Huguenots, and the, were the fleeing, the Lord showed the French that that was the seed of the gospel that left Europe came to Africa and a very interesting story that what I heard sitting there is that they took, they ripped up the, the vineyards, this, this, what do you call this stock? The, die vingert stock, Louise, die vingert stock. Anyway, so then they ripped it out of the ground, came all the way to Franz Hook and planted yeah. it and it flourished. Within a few years, they had the most incredible um, crop. And little did we know that in that era where they left, there was um, a, a fire that broke out and a disease that killed all the vineyards, all the vineyards in that area, okay? And they came back many years down the road. The French came here and asked, for some of those vineyard sticks, because it was a cultivar that was only in France, but now we only had it in Cape Town, in France Hook. And there was reconciliation that happened. Anyway, I was sitting in a meeting, and I was sitting there going, this is part of my inheritance. I'm embracing it. I did ask forgiveness for the atrocities of what happened after but there's a journey. There's a journey our people did. And the more we dig into it, there's blessings and there's curses. Let's ask forgiveness for the curses and embrace the blessings. Otherwise, I would have lost out on knowing some purposes God have for my people. I would. Wow. I, so I just, I, and I just want to say to every listener that's listening, like, that everything that even Natalie has just shared is that this can be for anyone who who can, you know, it's not just for people that have grown up in the church. It's not just for people that might classify as being religious. No, everyone has a history. Everyone has a background. Everyone carries something. And um, it can start, it can be running in our family, but it can end with us. And so everything that has been shared with what Natalie has shared is, is a possible reality, even for you. Um, and Natalie, I really like what you touched on with just, uh, breaking off the, the, the generational ties and curses. I saw this post on Facebook the other day that keeps popping up ironically. And it's so interesting. It's a picture of a man who's holding, um, he's pouring out like, like a scotch bottle or something. And the title, the caption is, it, it's, it started, it runs in the family until it runs to me or something. And it's of him pouring it out. I think I butchered it a bit, but basically it's saying it stops with me. Wow. And I think that is the significance of so much of what you have shared. The way how people view hate, the way people view racism. It, it is how we are going to view it. For me and my story, it is. I can either believe that every white person is out there to hurt black people, or I can actually believe God's purposes and truths and see how God has changed my life. Being a son of Africa brought up by the white man, Amen. I am a complete opposite wow. uh, on the different scale of that. So my hope 
And I know all of our hopes would be for those that listen, that they can also know that they have that same, yes. um, we're no better than them, but it is also there for them to reach out as well and to actually believe in the name of Jesus to do such things. Yes, yes. So, and God has that. no mistakes. There are no mistakes. We are born into an absolutely messed mm -hmm. up, broken world, but he made yeah. no mistakes. Mm -hmm. And for who we are, the way we look, the way we are put together, wired together, you know, there were times in our life that I would have loved to change me. But he mm -hmm. said, no, 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 no. I have it for a purpose, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think who, how we wired is to to love ourselves, to embrace ourselves, yeah. our color, our shape, our way we live, because God did not make mistakes. I'm sure at the end of the day, one day we will understand the yeah. fullness of it. We get glimpses of it now. And I think that is what we have carry the responsibility of, is to share the glimpses of revelation that we have, because it can be something that open up. Uh, and bring release and bring freedom to other people and, and we just need to be faithful yeah. to to carry our part in this i would just want to say honestly natalie i think you have embodied such uh an example of such a selfless woman but i think that's the right word who has you've you've been humbled because you've let god humble yourself mm -hmm. humble you and because you've let God bring you low, it's been him, not you, but he has like lifted you up. And I think that has, that's an example in your marriage, in your family, in the ministries you're a part of. And I, I, man, I'm encouraged. And I honestly believe like, I don't, I just know your story is one that is just of hope. And so I just thank you so much for, for sharing it. I love finding out our little connections. I know you and I know the same people. That is so cool. Um, even when you said Keith Green, I was like, hey, that's my <laughs> little claim to fame. I remember because Melody took me in and oh. we had a good one-on-one -on -one talk and wow. she, we were sitting at the piano and just, wow. and so, so just, you know, I, we vibe, we, we, as the young kids are saying, we vibe, you know, we're in the same yes, like, yes, circle. So. Yes, yes. It's pretty cool. Oh, it's yeah. so fantastic meeting you, Kate. I want to have so much more talks with you. Yeah. So, Natalie, I don't know. Do you have a, a final thought on your heart that you'd love to leave people with yeah. today before we finish? I just that, you know, the Lord uses everything, our journeys. And I left South Africa mm -hmm. at 22, came back at 40, a changed person with a husband and two kids, and lived in many places and learned a lot about myself. And uh, we came home for a year, but the Arab Spring broke out and some of the nations we were working in, all the doors shut for us. And we were in trauma. We're like, what now? And, um, and the Lord led me into school. I'm now a school teacher in a very, very multicultural school. And um, the Lord just showed me how to use the arts to let kids express themselves and find themselves and have a voice because they don't always have the vocabulary of how they feel. And um, the multicultural school I'm in, about 60% are non-whites and we have a lot of embassy kids. So we do have kids from Germany, America, Brazil, Mozambique, um, hmm. Nigeria, Kenya, and then South Africans. And I love it. I love it. I love it. And then I decided to study my master's degree in cross-cultural integration into schools because globally our schools are becoming super multicultural. Before in Germany, you all have only German kids and France, you all have French kids and America, you all have American kids, but it's suddenly you walk into any school and you will have a lot of immigrant kids. And you'll have people that have been moving between nations, work for work relations or whatever. Suddenly our schools are multicultural. And that is such a little core or nugget within the world that I just see little nuggets of schools to be cultivated and kids to be, to get these little treasures of um, learn from one another. 
learn, learn, be open, be like uh, little antennas, pick up from one another, that we never have to go through atrocities like apartheid or Black Lives Matter or let us just blend already from a young age and and grow, uh, that we be, become more responsible, open, embracing, and not so rigidly shaped into one mindset, but that our worldviews become um, just bigger, wider, and more embracing. Um, because that's what Jesus said, I am gathering you all together and you're going to be together for eternity. What a beautiful heaven. And if we can't even imagine being with others from other cultures, well, okay, seriously, then we need to work on it because that's just beauty, yeah. being together and um, learning from one another. So I really enjoy the season I'm in right now, although I miss the nations. But I have in every classroom, I have the little nation sitting in front of me. And yeah, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, oh, so thank you so much, Natalie. I think, yeah, I, I had the privilege for this almost a year and well, probably about, yeah, three quarters of a year to, to see you guys often and just to rub shoulders with you and listen to your stories. I love it. I really um, blessed by it, by the two of you, you and Honey together, your beautiful kids. Um, yeah, I just want to honor you for 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 being brave also to share your story because I, I'm, I'm sure it's not always, especially in South Africa, it's not always easy for people to listen to our view of things of because of our journey. So thank you for being brave to share it today. Um, yeah, and just, I, I think you are such a, ch a champ, you too, you and your husband are really <laughs> championeers. Can you say it like that? Championing <laughs> people, and I love that about you guys. Thank so, yeah, thank, thank, thank you, you so much yeah. for coming today, and I'm sure people will be blessed when they hear your story. Hey, thank you for joining us today. If you want to learn more about your own cultural identity, check out the links to our free resources to download in the notes of this episode. Please like, subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when our next episode is available to listen to.